Okay, it's time to write the final piece of the puzzle. Let's define and train the model. In TensorFlow.js, we have the concept of a model which contains layers of fundamental building blocks that you can use to make new model architectures. The first thing to do is to define a new model. In this instance, you do that by calling tf.sequential, indicating that all the layers you add will be executed sequentially one after each other. Essentially, this means the outputs of the first layer become the inputs to the second, and so on. For now, this is somewhat irrelevant as you'll be working with just one layer, but in the next part of the course, you'll see how to combine many of them together. Next, you can use model.add to add a certain layer type to the model. Here, you'll specify a tf.layers.dense layer. All this means is that each neuron in the layer is fully connected to all of the inputs. In this instance, you specify an input shape of two, representing the two inputs you want to pass into the model, the size of the house and the number of bedrooms. And you set the units to be one. Unit is essentially the number of neurons. This neuron, or unit if you will, will have one weight allocated to each input, meaning it's densely connected to those inputs. Also notice, no activation function is specified, meaning that in this case, it will not use one and just pass through the final total number it calculates. Now that you've defined your model, you can print a summary of what's been made to the console by calling model.summary as shown. You should see an output like the one shown here that shows the model will contain three trainable parameters and produce an output with a single value as shown by the output shape column. Great, so you've now got a model. The only thing left to do is to train it so that you can use it. Here, you can call a function called train that'll be defined in the next section. Now, I would just like to point out that defining the model architecture using the TensorFlow.js Layers API was just a few lines of code. In fact, the code you wrote for your normalized function took many more lines than this. Often, most of your time will actually be spent processing inputs and outputs, and the model creation itself is actually pretty simple to define once you're familiar with the terminology. Okay, so onto the training. Here you can define a function called train to get the model to adjust its weights and bias to learn from the data presented to it. First, you can start by defining something known as the learning rate. This value determines how big of a step it will take when changing the model's weights and bias. Here, you use a value of 0.01. But how is this value picked? Well, in short, it just took me some practice runs to see what allowed the model to train fast without making it so large that it failed to train correctly. If you set the number too high, you'll see values like NAN appear in the predictions indicating that something went wrong. If you see that, you can reduce its value maybe by a factor of 10 and try again. Now you can compile the model. Up until this point, the model was able to be changed or added to. By compiling the model, you're essentially finalizing it by defining some important parameters it will need to use when training. Let's see those hyperparameters in more detail. The first parameter is the optimizer. This is the method the model will use to try and hunt for the optimal values for the weights and bias. Here, you use tf.train.sgd, which stands for Stochastic Gradient Descent. This is just the name of a mathematical algorithm used to update the weights, and it needs to be told what learning rate you wish to use for its updates, so you also pass it the learning rate from the line above. The second parameter here is the loss function to use. Just like you learned in the previous chapter, you'll use the mean squared error loss function. As this is such a common way to measure loss, TensorFlow.js has it implemented already, so you can just use a string to tell it to use that. Alternatively, you can write your own function to calculate loss yourself and pass that function instead. Now that the model is compiled with some key parameters defined, the next step is to actually start the training. This can be achieved by calling await model.fit, which is an asynchronous call to which you pass three objects. The first is the input tensor containing all the features. Here you pass the feature underscore results dot normalized underscore values as the inputs, which contains your normalized feature inputs from the previous section. Next is the expected output tensor. In this case, you pass outputs underscore tensor that contains the values that the model is trying to predict from the inputs. Finally, you can also specify an object to define some extra parameters. Let's dive into those. 
First, you can set validation split. This sets aside a certain amount of the training data to never use in training and only use to see how well the model performs after the training is complete. Here, you can set it to 0.15, representing 15% of the data to set aside for this. As you have thousands of examples in this case, using 15% is reasonable, but if you had only 30 examples, then you might want to skip using a validation split. Next, you can set shuffle to be true. Shuffle just means the data in the input and output tensors will be randomly shuffled each time it goes through the data set to avoid it learning anything about the order of the data presented, which can sometimes cause issues if you don't do this. Note that shuffling preserves order across the input and output tensor data, so if element 5 moved to element 1 for the input tensor, the same would happen to the output tensor, so the input data still correlates correctly to the right output data. Moving on, you now also specify something known as batch size. This represents the number of examples it will try before it calculates the average loss and then update the weights and bias of your model. If you set a batch size to 1, it means it will update the weights and bias for every data point in the training data, which can take a long time. Furthermore, this can lead to noisy results, as in one example it may be a positive loss, and in the next example it might have a negative loss, and so on, leading to the line of best fit not really tending to a general direction very well. As you have a few thousand examples here, a batch size of 64 is a nice trade-off between the time taken and getting a good sampling of the data to fit a line to. It's also quite common to see batch sizes to be powers of 2 like this. Finally, you have the number of epochs. An epoch is just a fancy word that describes going through all the training data once. Here, you set the number of epochs to 10, which means you'll go through your training data 10 times. So there's no magic answer for what numbers to pick for the number of epochs, and simply involves experimentation to see how many you need before you start seeing reasonable results. In this use case, if you have 2,000 rows of example inputs in your training data, you're essentially going to process 20,000 examples as you're repeating this 10 times. Now remember, your batch size was 64, so you'll be making around 312 updates to the models, weights, and biases in this case. Hopefully, this is enough for the system to find the best line of fit. Great, at this point, training should now be complete. Here you can dispose of any tensors you no longer need, as shown to clean up the memory. You can also print some of the results of the training data to the console. In this case, you can print the average error loss on the test data by accessing the results.history.loss array and then selecting the last item in that array, which represents the last loss value recorded. Now remember, you use the loss method of mean squared error, so to get the number returned in terms of a non-squared value, you simply square root the loss number shown here. In a similar manner, you can also get the validation loss to see how well it fares on truly unseen data as well. Finally, you can call an evaluate function to try out your newly trained model, now training is complete, which we'll define in the next section. Now, if you run the program at this point, after a few seconds, you'll see something similar to what's shown printed here in the console. However, as the weights and biases are chosen randomly at the start, your exact numbers may differ. Here, however, you can see that the test loss is about $18,300, which is really rather good. Checking the validation loss, you can see it's slightly higher at around $35,400. Now, even though this is a higher value, it's still better than I could do myself. I think if I were to guess the price of a house, I might be accurate to within $100,000, let's say, so this is still better than me. And that is the key point. If the machine learning model you produce can outperform what you already do and by a meaningful amount, then that is one good reason to deploy that solution and use it over the previous method you were using. If you found the results were not beating some baseline expectations, you may need to explore using more features or gathering more data before deprecating the old system. And finally, it's time to use your freshly trained model to try on some new input that you want to predict. Here you define an evaluate function once the model is trained to try it out. First, wrap your prediction code in a tf.tidy to automatically clean up created tensors. Next, you can create a new tensor2d constructed with the two input feature values you want to try. In this case, you use 750 square feet and one bedroom. Now remember, you must also normalize these numbers as the train model works on normalized inputs.
As such, you can pass it through the previously defined normalization function, but this time pass to it the second and third parameters with the already calculated and saved feature min and max values respectively. This will return a new tensor containing the normalized values. You can now use the new input's normalized values as an input to model.predict, which will run those values through the trained model and produce a new tensor as an output with the answer. You can simply print this answer to the console for now using its print method. Here you can see for the model I trained, I get a prediction of $126,725, which seems roughly correct given the dataset that this was trained on. Now remember, you could call model.predict as many times as you like once the model is trained. You only need to do the training once. And if you want to save your model for future use, you can choose to save the train model to your computer as a download or to local storage in the browser using the model.save function as shown. And do note, if you try to download on glitch.com, ensure your live preview of your web app is in a new window. Iframed page previews are not allowed to create downloads by default, so you'll see an error in the console in that case. Simply open the live preview in a new window instead of showing it next to the code and allow multiple downloads when asked. And of course, to use a saved model, you can use the code shown here. Do note, you should also manually take note of your input feature min max values that you use for normalization, else you won't be able to pre-process new values you want to make a prediction on later. Finally, if you're finished using the model, you can destroy the remaining tensors and the model itself by calling dispose on all of them. And you can also log the number of tensors left in the memory to double check you got them all. Hopefully you've managed to follow along as needed to replicate what's been shown, but if something's not working, compare what you've written to my working version on this code available on the link on the slide. So congratulations on implementing your first TensorFlow.js model to solve the problem of linear regression. While predicting a straight line might not seem like a huge progress, in the next sections, what you learn will simply build upon the code you have here to do more powerful things, like being able to predict data that's not defined by a straight line. And once you can do that, you even have a chance to predict simple images. I'll see you in the next section where you'll step up your game to create even more powerful models using multi-layer perceptrons, which is where deep learning gets its name, as you have many layers of neurons working together to make more complex predictions. <laughs>